Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 426 of the Juice Box Podcast. Today's show is a Defining Diabetes episode with Jenny Smith, and I'm excited to bring it to you. And it's going to begin right after this. Gvoke Hypopen has no visible needle and is the first pre-mixed auto-injector of glucagon for very low blood sugar in adults and kids with diabetes ages 2 and above. Not only is Gvoke Hypopen simple to administer, but it's simple to learn more about. All you have to do is go to gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. Gvoke shouldn't be used in patients with insulinoma or pheochromocytoma. Visit gvokeglucagon.com slash risk. Are you looking to help with type 1 diabetes research? If you are, you can do it right from your home, right there on your phone or your laptop. Just go to t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box. Answer the questions they ask, which I've answered for Arden and are very kind of benign, to be perfectly honest. You need to be from the United States and have type 1 diabetes or be from the United States and care for someone who does. They're just looking for everyday input about your type 1 diabetes life. Then they use that data to make great advancements for people with type 1 diabetes. I've mentioned them all before, and I can mention them again at the end of the show. But your effort, your tiny little few-minute effort, could go a long way towards helping everyone living with type 1 diabetes. T1DExchange.org forward slash juice box. And if it's been a minute since you thought about your blood sugar meter, if you really never even considered it in the beginning when you got it, like, I wonder if this is a good one or not, that happens to a lot of us. A lot of people just get handed a meter by a doctor, not realizing there are many meters available and that they vary in their accuracy, ease of use, and ease to carry. My daughter uses the Contour Next One blood glucose meter, and it checks all of those boxes. Easy to carry, easy to use, and incredibly accurate. The Contour Next One blood glucose meter also has test strips that are special. In so much as that, you know, I don't know, you, this has got to have happened to you, right? You make a blood drop, you touch it with a test strip, and it's not enough blood, and then you have to throw the test strip away. You don't have to do that with the Contour Next One. You get to go back in. There's a second chance, and it doesn't impact the accuracy of the test. It's a money saver, and it's a time saver, and honestly, it just makes things less aggravating. Contour Next One. That's the meter you should be looking into, and you can at contournext.com forward slash juice box. It's a very comprehensive website where you can find out about the Contour Next One meter, but you can also look into their test strip saving programs, and some of you may be eligible for a free meter. There's a lot going on at contournext.com forward slash juice box. I'd ask you to go take a look. Thank you so much for supporting the sponsors. There are no more ads in this episode. Don't forget to check out the T1D Exchange at t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box. You definitely want to look into Gvoke Glucagon, gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. And of course, I just spoke about the meter that my daughter's been using forever. There are links in the show notes, links at juiceboxpodcast.com. When you support the sponsors, you support the show. Before we get started, please don't forget that nothing you hear on the Juice Box Podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan or becoming bold with insulin. Today's episode is part of the Defining Diabetes series, which lives here inside of the Juice Box podcast. Today, Jenny and I will be discussing growth hormone. My friend Jenny Smith has had type 1 diabetes since she was a child, I think for over 31 years now. Jenny holds a bachelor's degree in human nutrition and biology from the University of Wisconsin. She is a registered and licensed dietitian, a certified diabetes educator, and a certified trainer on most makes and models of insulin pumps 
and continuous glucose monitoring systems. In my mind, I believe Jenny can do anything. So I want to just define growth hormone and then talk a little bit about how people might see it in their, in their blood sugar management. You probably have a lot of um, visual from eons of life with a very small child through teen years. I can picture the whole horrible journey in my head. (laughs) (laughs) It felt like for a long time that I would get Arden's insulin right, I'd get one night of sleep, and then it would change again. And then it would take me forever to figure out, this was in the beginning, and then it would change again, and it would change, and she'd get bigger and taller. And Arden's 16 now. Arden's like mm-hmm. five, seven and a half. Like, she's a, a fairly tall, tall person. Um, mm-hmm. So she just kept growing. Like, at one point, I was like, just stop here. Here's fine. You, you know? Um and it is interesting to watch girls mature too, because she got, um, she she would get tall, mm-hmm. then she would get curvier, then she would get tall again. But with my son, who doesn't have diabetes, he would get tall, his legs would get heavy, and huh. then he'd get taller again. His, we knew he was going to get taller because his calves would get like oddly too big for Thicker. his yeah for his body, mm-hmm. and then boom, he'd get taller again. It was very interesting. But but so growth hormone. Um, also known as human growth hormone, uh, is a peptide hormone that stimulates growth, cell reproduction, cell regeneration in humans and other animals, blah, blah, blah. It's really important, and you want your kids to grow, obviously. But every time they grow, (laughs) why does it happen overnight? Like, why do do people, like, you know what I mean? Like, it's like... Yeah, I mean that's a good question. I would expect, I mean, there's a lot of... um, there's a lot of processes that your body sort of goes through overnight because it's it's a time period of day that your body has time to pay attention to itself. I, that sounds kind of weird, but like you're sleeping, mm-hmm. right? You're not running or you're not like, you know, doing math equations or <laughs> right? so now's a good it's time, a time to stretch period. you out. It's also a time period. And it's the big reason that a lot of people see weirdness in blood sugar if they're eating late at night and then they go to bed on that. Right. Because mm-hmm. really your digestive system sort of slows down, relaxes. It's not really supposed to be digesting so late at night. So the same thing with growth and repair, it's a time period of the 24 hour day that your body has a chance to recoup, regenerate, repair, and growth happens in that time period. I swear, sometimes when my boys wake up in the morning, I'm like, you grew overnight. You look bigger, yeah. You look bigger this morning than you did last night. Well, not to get too far off the subject, but did you just explain to me why I can't eat too late at night or I'll have heartburn because my body really is that that simple? Yeah. It also, I mean, to go along with it too is, uh, to, relative to heartburn is, you know, during the daytime when we're upright, we have the benefit of gravity working on our digestive system. It's pulling everything through along with the natural like movement and the muscles and everything that move things through the digestive system. Gravity is helping. But when you lay down, you're right. now flat. Right. You have no advantage of gravity at all. And your digestive system slows down overnight. It's not really meant to be digesting like that. <sighs> so not only for people like you without diabetes, but right. definitely people with diabetes. I'm curious, you know, I eat this at nine o'clock or nine thirty, ten o'clock at night, and I don't see any problems with blood sugar until like three o'clock in the morning. And it wasn't high fat. I would oh. have expected to affect like, you know, faster given the fact that it wasn't high fat and whatnot. But it's a much well, slower digestion. It's slower digestion. Hey, this is why these conversations are good. We figure things out while we're doing this. <laughs> um, but so the growth hormone, your kids are growing. Totally not relative to growth yeah. hormone. Well, I don't know. We found it. It <laughs> seems relative to me. So, you know, your body needs those hormones to grow. No different than maybe a woman who's getting her period. These hormones come in, they impact your blood sugar and can impact them really Right. Like strong. Uh, there are times, there have been times in Arden's life where her basal rate has been double overnight than it is yes. now as she's older. And it, right. it, it is not, it is going to happen to everybody. So, 
in right. the end. And it's, I mean, you know, the growth hormone is essentially, it's, it's just, it's a stress hormone really. Okay. Like, um, like your adrenaline or your epinephrine, like cortisol, all of these hormones, growth hormone included are, they're kind of blood sugar raisers. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so do. when you're, but when your kids, so when your kids growing, that's what I, you know, you, you so people say these kind of not trite, but oversimplified things about diabetes, like, oh, you know, every time you get it right, I mean, I told the story, every time you get it right, it's going to change. But that's not really what's happening. It's that sometimes your kid's growing, and then then they're not, then they are again, and this seems to happen overnight, and you're going to have periods of blood sugars that are going up, uh, and it'll seem like maybe it's happening for no reason, but it's very likely because your kid's growing. So Right. Um, and it typically as you've as you probably saw too, it's that growth happens over like oftentimes a couple of days mm -hmm. and then it appears to just be done. Yeah. Right. And then it might be a cyclic. Like I've I got a couple of families who followed it enough that they're like, every couple of weeks we get the same pattern. Mm -hmm. And we know that we need this much more insulin. So we dump it in. We end up having much more beautiful evenings. Sometimes we end up Kind of, kind of coming to a happy medium between the high insulin need of the growth hormone kicking in and where they were before. They sort of sit between that. They never go back down completely to where they were before they grew, but they're not staying as high as they needed during that growth hormone impact. So these people are watching so specifically, they're actually seeing the growth hormone impact and they're seeing that there's a gentle rise in insulin need as the in person's getting need. bigger to begin with, which yeah. I always just break down to like, growth or body weight or, you know, like they're bigger, they need more. Although I talked to somebody yesterday and um, they were freaking me out. They're like, my daughter's 130 pounds and her basal rate's 0.35. And I'm going over it in my head and I'm like, none of that makes sense. None of that makes sense. None of that makes sense. And I was like, wait, 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 how long has she had diabetes? She goes four months. I'm like, ah, got it. Okay. You're still getting some insulin from your from yes. your pancreas. I got it. Okay. So yeah. it's interesting. That that That's a funny one too. I've gotten a quite a number of littler kids lately to work with that like talking to the parents it's very evident when i when i look at their with their at their insulin use is they have a very very low basal mm -hmm. comparative to their insulin needs around meal times and anytime you've got that like this kind of goes back to insulin deficit a little bit anytime there's a deficit in basal but when you take or have no meal, that basil is working beautifully at like 0 0.05. And sometimes they don't even need that. Mm. But when they add a meal in, they need this like whopping three unit bolus, or they're ending up at 300 blood sugar. That's a good indication that you're still in honeymoon. Yeah. Because basil and bolus, I mean, the old saying is kind of a 50, 50. We know that it's a little bit up down, Right. person to person. But if you're at such a strange difference where your basal is giving you 10, 12% of your total daily insulin and the rest is coming from bolus, you're definitely still in honeymoon. Something's still happening. Yeah. That makes sense. Also, like for, as you get older, I, I do want to understand this eventually. And it's, here's not the place to talk about, it, but when you get sick, why do sometimes your insulin needs go down when you get sick? You ever notice that? Like, there's certain illnesses that goes up with, but there's certain illnesses that goes down with. I don't know the difference. I just know yeah, I mean, for the most part, a simple answer is oftentimes if it's an infection, mm -hmm. usually your insulin needs, I would say 95%, maybe even more, it, your insulin needs will go up. Right. An infection is a significant stress on the body, um, especially uh, an infection with like a fever mm -hmm. or that really has you like down, you can't go to school or you can't go to work or whatnot. Opposite is usually the stomach bug illnesses that require the, the lower insulin. Okay. Mostly because one, you're not taking in as much. So metabolically you need a bit less. Mm -hmm. um, also, you may not necessarily be keeping things down, yeah. whichever way they're kind of coming out. Um, that, talks to, we go back to kind of the digestive system. Whenever you're taking things in that you can in a stomach bug, your body's not absorbing as much out of them. And so your insulin needs go down because you're just not processing them. Listen, in the same vein, and I haven't said this in a while on the podcast, and I know you have to go, but um, That's okay. one day Arden's going to listen back to this and be like, so tell me again how you discussed constipation. Uh, but when Art, before we, <laughs> before we knew Arden had 
uh, hypothyroidism, mm-hmm. she got really constipated. And the more constipated she got, the higher her blood sugar would get. And then once she went to the bathroom, boom, her blood sugar came back down again. And I was always like, wow, is her body just continuing to leach even out of even out of waste? That's fascinating, isn't it? All right. Yeah. That's See, a little bit gross. But. Hey, it's completely gross, but it happens. And this podcast yes. is about what happens. So you gotta That's you gotta right. know what is what I mean. How, <laughs> we we can't come on here and talk about the same boring stuff that everybody else wants to talk about. about no, diabetes. That wouldn't ju- be fun. It's just a number. Okay, thanks. Right. <laughs> Big help. <laughs> Appreciate all your insight. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well. You did bring up a really, I, I really, I want to look further into why growth is more at night. I mean, that's an interesting question that I guess I've never really thought about other than just knowing that growth hormone comes from the pituitary in the brain. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if it has something to do more with when the pituitary gland is supposed to be active, which maybe that is at night. Okay. Um, I don't know, but that's, I'd have to look it up. It's a good question. A huge thank you to one of today's sponsors, Gvoke Glucagon. Find out more about Gvoke Hypopen at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. You spell that G V O K E G L U C A G O N dot com forward slash juice box. To learn more about the Contour Next One Blood Glucose Meter, please go to contournext.com forward slash juice box. And I told you I was going to tell you a little something about the T1D exchange, and I will in just a second. If you'd like to learn more about what Jenny does at Integrated Diabetes, go to integrateddiabetes.com. The podcast has a private Facebook group that you can find, uh, you know, on Facebook. It's called Juicebox Podcast, and then there's a colon, and then it's type 1 diabetes. There's also a public page called Bold with Insulin. I'm on Instagram, too. Just hit 10,000 followers there. That was kind of cool because I'm not very good at Instagram. What a salesman I am. Hey, would you like to see an Instagram page that's probably not good? Go to Instagram. Okay, back to the T1D exchange. The T1D exchange is looking for T1 adults or T1 caregivers who are U.S. residents to participate in a quick survey that can be completed in just a few minutes from your phone or computer. After you finish the questions, they are very simple. I did them in about seven minutes. You will be contacted annually to update your information and to be asked further questions. This is 100% anonymous, completely HIPAA compliant, and it does not require you to ever see a doctor or go to a remote site. Now, every time someone completes the process using the link T1D Exchange forward slash juice box, the podcast benefits. So if you've been looking for a way to help type one research, the podcast or both, nothing could be easier or more beneficial. After you get to T1D Exchange using my link, click on join our registry now, and after that, simply complete the survey. Past participants like you have helped to bring increased coverage for test strips, Medicare coverage for CGMs, and changes in the ADA's guidelines for pediatric A1C goals. And it's exciting to imagine what your participation will lead to. Thanks so much for listening. I'll talk to you soon.